We've seen so many images from around the world of people living in poverty, starving, and even forced out of their homes because of crises happening in their home countries. According to the International Rescue Committee, in 2014, the number of people in humanitarian need was 81 million. Next year, it's expected to hit 339 million people. The IRC keeps track of countries that it says shows the greatest risk of a new humanitarian emergency. We're joined now by David Miliband, the IRC's president and CEO. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you for having us. me on. So such an important topic. Let's start out with the watch list, how you decide which countries end up on it. So the watch list that we produce every year is based on 67 different data sources, but also critically the intelligence of our 220 field sites in 40 countries around the world that are either in conflict, countries Syria, Somalia, Ethiopia, or countries that are harboring, sheltering people who are refugees from conflict. And we take that quantitative data and the qualitative data and then produce this watch list which this year has ranked Somalia at the top, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Democratic Republic of Congo, Yemen. Those are the key countries at the top of the list. But here's the thing that really strikes me. Of that 20 countries on the watch list, they account for 90% of all the humanitarian need in the world. Mm. You also talked about the accelerators. Um, what are those? The three accelerators that we see in our work are first of all conflict. That's the biggest driver of crisis today. There are 54 civil wars, wars within states going on around the world, plus, of course, the Ukraine conflict. Those wars create humanitarian devastation. Uh, the second is the climate crisis, which is not the crisis of our children or the crisis of our grandchildren. It's today's crisis. And in countries like the US, of course, we're quite well protected. The infrastructure is resilient. But in countries like Yemen or Somalia or Ethiopia, Pakistan recently with the, with the floods, livelihoods and infrastructure gets washed away. So the climate crisis and the climate emergency is second. And third, and this is the kicker this year, this is what's driven up the numbers so much in this year, the economic shocks, not just of the end of COVID, but more specifically, the Ukraine war driving up food prices, driving up energy prices. And you also talk about these guardrails for communities that are affected by crises. Some of those communities that you just mentioned, like with famine, for example, what would a guardrail for something like that be? Well, a guardrail is humanitarian aid that can oh. keep you alive. It's medicines because, of course, malnutrition then leads into disease. It's uh, also protection from sometimes your own government, sometimes from armed opposition groups. We're seeing the breakdown of uh, order and of the rights of civilians in, in conflict around the world. So the guardrails are essentially the buffers that mean even if you can't stop the crisis, you can stop it having devastating consequences. Are there any countries that you're considering or you're especially concerned about because they're likely going to be on the list by next year? Well, Ukraine's an obvious example. It's at number 10. The danger is it goes up. Uh, a country like Venezuela, surprising for people, it's exported 5 million uh, refugees. Once you're down below the 20th, you're then uh, having to really put your finger in the air. You don't know quite where the next crisis is going to come from. What can people do to help? Well, if they're Americans, they can volunteer at their local International Rescue Committee office because we are the largest refugee resettlement agency in America. I hope people use their voice as well because uh, it's a time when global risks are rising. America's a global leader. It needs to be there standing side by side with people. And although I'm a Brit, so I don't like talking about <laughs> money, uh, they can all, you can always, you, uh, we'd love your uh, viewers to visit our website, rescue.org, and support us. Last question. I'm an analogy person, so forgive me here if this is really apples and oranges, but I'm imagining when you have, you know, endangered animals and you create this list to say, hey, this species is in danger of dying out, right? Uh, when you put it on a list, does it save the life of the animal? And the, 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 the parallel here, I'm wondering, is by putting countries on this watch list yes. uh, that are in such extreme and dire peril, yes. do you see any benefit from identifying and actually putting them on the That's list? That's a really interesting point. They, they say in management, you manage what you measure. Mm. And if you don't measure, you're not going to manage it. So I really want to make sure that your viewers know International humanitarian action does work. There are solutions out there. What we're suffering from is too many problems and too many people focused locally where there are problems too. But if we forget the outside world, I think there are big dangers ahead. David Miliband, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. We thank you, thank you. for your time and insight. Thanks for having me.
Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.